Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ian Wormsley. I'm the provost here at Imperial College London, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this wonderful evening as we continue our celebrations of the uh, life and works of Abdus Salam. So a warm welcome to guests both in person, out there online, in lecture theatres around the campus, and indeed all around the world. Uh, we are in the presence of very many distinguished guests uh, and are particularly pleased to be able to welcome members of the Salam family here this evening together with some of his former students, his collaborators, and indeed the new generation of physicists that's taking forward the work that he started here. First of all, I have to just you know, be down to earth a bit. There's a few bits of housekeeping that you need to know about. Um, if there's a fire, follow the emergency exit signs through the doors out here leave the hall, um, yeah, by the exit doors. There are no windows, so you can't jump out. Um, the assembly point is Dangor Plaza, right out, outside this building, and please follow the directions of the staff who will be on hand to guide you. Uh, also, please, there's no filming of this event this evening, so please could you make sure that your phones are kept away and switched off. Now, today marks Professor Salam's 98th birthday, and it is a fitting occasion to celebrate his legacy, both for Imperial College and for the world. Our newly named Abdus Salam Library was unveiled today, and we have a display of artifacts from his life and works uh, in the Queen's Tower Room. These are events that I hope will set the scene for further engagement with him and further initiatives around the science done here into the future. In looking at his artifacts, I was really struck by his clear recognition that there are many different routes to understanding fundamental truths about the world, and that within those, science holds a very special place and the opportunity to use science to build on a greater understanding between peoples of the world must continue to be foremost in our works and actions. It's incumbent on all of us, I think, to make sure that that's accessible and includes everybody, and that we are clear that knowledge and understanding are not disposable elements that we can live without. Imperial is considered to be the birthplace of the standard model of elementary particles and the unification of the fundamental forces of the natural world, uh, at least those we know about at the moment. Uh, and I'm continually amazed by the, the strength of the ongoing research in theoretical physics here and the pers continued pursuit of the directions that Professor Salam set. By one measure, Imperial ranks uh, is the fifth most impactful university in the world uh, in theoretical high energy physics. And that is largely due to the tradition of excellence which Professor Salam uh, incorporated when he set up the group in the late 1950s. It is something that I think is uh, a model for the ways in which we should continue to do science in the future. Today, there are several thousand people watching the talks, uh, both in, in, in person and across the college and all over the world. And that's a testament, I think, to the excitement in the field, as well as to Professor Salam's ongoing legacy. So let me now pass over to my colleague, Professor Claudia Duram, one of our professors of theoretical physics here at Imperial, who will be chairing the remainder of this evening. So enjoy. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, thank you. I'm Professor Claudia Ram, um, and I'll be chairing the rest of this session. No pressure for me. Um, I think you have quite a treat. Um, we have really very nice lined up talks uh, for you. But before I get there, let me just say that as I come here, 
I have to say, I'm used myself as a theoretical physicist to thinking of Salam's legacy as being part of, of everything we do, from the way we think about nature and the fundamental forces to the way we connect, interact, and collaborate with, with people all around the world. But as I come here and I see all of you, and I know there are thousands of people connecting online from all over the world, it's not just about connecting from the south to the north and the east to the west. It's really about connecting some uh, scientists who are experts in the field with people who maybe until tonight may never have heard of the electric force or Hawking radiation or dark energy or ICTP as you're going to hear about. And then I, I can promise you, you're going to be instantly infused with a passion. Um, take your vote for you. And I, I think that's because science really is an, in is itself a unifying force, and so is Abdul Salam. So it's a really great pleasure to introduce you with the first speaker of tonight, Professor Atish Tabolka. He's Director General of uh, the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, with a network of institutions uh, throughout the planet. And he'll be talking to you about joining forces. Thank you. Please welcome Atish. Okay, thank you, Claudia. So it's a real pleasure for me and honor to be here for this uh, very important event. And I'm really glad to see that uh, the very important legacy of Salam is being recognized by a major in university uh, like Imperial College in the UK. Uh, and I'm very happy that the family of Salam, as well as his academic family, many of his former students and uh, postdocs and uh, colleagues are here. Uh, and uh, I, Abdul Salam also founded the International Center for Theoretical Physics, so I bring in that perspective uh, of Salam's legacy. Uh, and like Salam, I also work in theoretical physics myself in topics related to string theory and black holes. So I, I want to tell you a bit about uh, his unique legacy, I would say. And that's why I've called it joining forces to unify nature and to unite the world. I think these were the two passions of uh, Salam. Uh, and this sort of slide gives you uh, the impact he has had, not only on science. So this is, by the way, where ICTP is. It's a beautiful location in Trieste on the Miramare Castle. On the, here is ICTP. And uh, uh, so this is what I want to tell you about. The first half will be about unifying nature, and the other half will be about uniting the world. So let's go back to the simplest example of unification, which you may not know about, but all of you use in your mobile phone. Unification of electricity, magnetism, and light. And I call them the three sides of the same coin. So this we see, this is electricity. This is magnetism. They apparently have absolutely nothing to do with each other. But one of the great remarkable insights which came through the work of many physicists, and then Maxwell kind of put the final finishing work on it. He wrote down his very beautiful equations that could describe diverse manifestations of electric and magnetic phenomena as parts of a single whole. So even though th this and this apparently look nothing like each other, they are actually parts of the same reality. And his equations are actually surprisingly easy to write down. Here are, here are these equations. Very simple, df equal to zero, d star f is equal to star j. I won't explain what they mean, but. And roughly speaking, he basically understood that magnetism is electricity in motion. Because if you have a charge, it produces electricity. If it is moving, it's a current, it produces magnetic field. But even more striking is what comes after it. But surprisingly, light, which is yet another completely unrelated phenomena, falls out of these beautiful equations, pops out just for free. So light of all colors, X-rays, radio waves, they can all be viewed as the manifestation of electromagnetic waves, as electromagnetic manifest. So this is the fundamental idea of unification. Uh, and as you see, it has been enormously influential. 
Now, this raises the question that can we have unification of electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactive decays, which was, in, you know, which was discovered with the work of Becquerel and Marie Curie and so on. And that's a question that many of the brightest physicists of the 20th century tried to answer. And one of the great physicists had this to say, let no man join together what God hath torn asunder. You know, this was a play on this biblical injunction when you get married. Let no man tear asunder what God hath joined together. And this is by Wolfgang Pauli, one of the greats of quantum mechanical revolution. But history showed that this was a comment which is more wise, more witty than it was wise. Because surprisingly, it turns out, and this is what uh, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg got their Nobel Prize, it is indeed possible to unify the electro electromagnetism and, and weak. In, but it requires new ingredients like the non-abelian gauge theories, and you'll hear about it in the talk later, spontaneous symmetry breaking, new particles like massive vector bosons and the Higgs boson, which you might have heard about. And I should point out here that some of the work took place right here. Salam was, when he founded ICTP in 1964, we'll be celebrating our 60th anniversary. He used to divide his time between Imperial College and there. And some of the important ideas uh, about, uh, I think Steven Weinberg was visiting here. Tim, uh, Tom Kibble was a faculty member here, a collaborator, uh, was a colleague of Salam. So I think uh, Imperial College, in a true sense, was where some of these very important and deep ideas of modern physics were born. And I want to give yet another analogy for, for you. This is a, it's, it's as if uh, physics is a bit like you being an archeologist and you have discovered some beautiful temple and the people here worship one deity which is called electromagnetism. And then uh, far away there is another very beautiful temple with a very different style. You can see the pillars are vertical and they worship yet another deity. It has a different entrance and it's called the weak nuclear force. And then you dig a little bit deeper and some clever archeologists dig further and they discover that it's actually, there is an amazing temple complex and these two temples are actually connected to each other through some secret passage. And this is what I would describe electroweak unification as. This was electroweak, the electricity and this is weak, but they are actually part of the same beautiful temple complex. And this, yet another analogy I can give you, is like, is as though you have one set of, uh, it's like a Lego blocks, you have a beautiful structure made of Lego blocks, and another beautiful structure made up of mechanos, and it looks like they have nothing to do with each other. With each other. But if you discover, somebody discovers pieces which, which can actually connect the two things, then suddenly this becomes part of a single whole. And this is how I would describe unification. It has been an inspiring guiding principle since Maxwell and Einstein. And uh, electroweak unification, it has, was one of the important milestones. But I think it remains an outstanding problem for the 21st century to unify, because I told you all the for many forces, but the force of gravity is not included in this. And how to unify it with the rest of the structure is what occupies the research of myself and many of my colleagues here, and I have to say, as the provost pointed out, uh, Imperial College has made some of the major breakthroughs in this field of string theory and theory of supergravity. And I had the fortune, good fortune, to write uh, papers with a number of colleagues here. And once again, to use the Meccano analogy, it's a little bit like electrons and photons are like the Lego blocks, and gravity, which is carried by gravitons, is like the Meccano blocks. And how do you connect the two has been an outstanding problem. And it turns out these are like particles going and this is like an electron going and a photon coming out and electron going and here is a graviton going and they are interacting in that way. And what string theory does, this is the latest uh, for the last 40, 30, 40, 50 years people have been working on it. It imagines that these two are like uh, uh, Lego blocks and Meccano are manifestations of the same string. If the string vibrates in a certain way, it's like a violin string, 
if it produces a note, certain note, it looks like electron or a photon, and if it f vibrates in some other way, it looks like a graviton, but there is the same underlying reality, and that can unify all forces and really realize in the dream of unification completely. So this is unification of nature, and you will hear much more in detail from Ryan's talk, and I'm sure he has wonderful ways of explaining this to you. I want to now briefly tell you in the last couple of minutes uh, about the Sorry, maybe, I don't know. Okay. Can I switch this off? Yeah. You can switch it off. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is now called the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, as I said, it is located here. And this goes back, the inspiration goes back to this uh, wonderful quote of Salam, that scientific thought and, it, and its creation is the common and shared heritage of humankind. And, uh, you know, I can, this is something that is really close to my heart. I mean, this is why I agreed to take up this role. Uh, Salam grew up in a small village in Pakistan, and he found that he had to make this terrible choice between uh, pursuing science or living in his own country. And he decided that he would like to create a place, an international hub for science, where scientists from all over the world can come together to help overcome the barriers of uh, gender and ethnicity, but even more so of geography and economics, which can be sometimes even more deciding, so that science becomes accessible to everyone. And that is the inspiration behind the ICTP. And it has been functioning beautifully with basically we have three principles, I would say, excellence at the frontiers of science, global inclusion for scientific resources, and international cooperation through science. So it's really uniting the world, not uniting, so joining forces to unite the world through science, overcoming these barriers. And we are a UN organization within a tripartite agreement uh, between these three entities. And I'm very happy that today, actually, we signed an agreement with uh, uh, the president kindly signed an agreement with Imperial College to recognize this uh, deep connection that we have with Imperial College and the collaborations that we already have with uh, scientific collaborations with Imperial to strengthen them so that uh, Imperial can also be a partner in reaching out, uh, taking science to the rest of the world. So just to give you a quick numbers, we invite every year almost 7,000 scientists to our campus in ICTP. About two-thirds are from developing countries who are fully funded by ICTP. So we have, ICTP has had, so this is another part of Salam's legacy, that it has really had impact and a real direct influence on the careers of really literally 200,000 scientists from around the world, from 188 nations. So it has been an enormous impact in building scientific communities around the world. And it has, and as well to contributions to many scientific breakthroughs. So it's really important that we pursue excellence and inclusion together, including five Nobel Prizes. One of them belongs to Salam. And we now have partner institutes in Rwanda, Brazil, in China, in Mexico. So uh, this is, I would say, is a summary of Salam's legacy. On one hand, he was a pioneering physicist uh, who's, uh, who made very important contributions to this dream of unification to which we continue to, the whole community continues to be engaged with. And he created a center which I think is unique in the world uh, where you see this kind of uh, availability that a Nobel laureate could be speaking with a young scientist from a far corner of the world about the latest developments in science or where Chinese and Indian and Pakistani scientists can come together to discuss how the monsoon is going to work and the climate models for the monsoon, forgetting possible political barriers. So I think this is the humanitarian mission of uh, contribution of um, Salam, I believe is perhaps even more important than his scientific contributions. So thank you. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. So um, I thought 
I'll start with a question from uh, the audience uh, that was submitted before, uh, related to really when, when we listen to you, we see that you inspire so many people, so many young minds. So. Um, and I should say, even earlier today, we have um, some essay contest, and the um, uh, the winners were announced. And through those essay, it was really remarkable to see how Salam has inspired them throughout the journey. And sometimes a very difficult journey, but in following his legacy, they really achieved what, what they wanted to do. So the questions are: was um, one adapted from Ron from Harrow? I don't know if Ron is in the audience. Um, how can you build on Salam's legacy to better engage with the next generation of scientists from diverse background? I think, uh, is it on? Yeah, okay. No, I think uh, engaging with uh, uh, diversity, I mean, sometimes diversity is uh, presented as equality of opportunity. But I think uh, Salam actually had a very interesting uh, talk. It's called, uh, sorry, not Salam, uh, Jim Gates, who was a, a pre previous president of American Physical Society. He said, what Abdus Salam taught me about jazz, <laughs> okay? And his point being that uh, jazz actually explores a very different kind of musical space. And if, if the world consisted only of uh, white male uh, musicians, then they will maybe discover Mozart, but they will not discover, and I, this I can identify, in, Indian classical music explores a very different kind of musical space than Western classical music or jazz explores a very different. So bringing in uh, talents from around the world uh, gives you a different perspective. And Ramanujan is a f famous example that he had a different way of doing number theory. And that led to new insights which would not have been possible in a certain way of doing things. And I think I would say this is the role that I think making science globally available, ICTP does that, and I think Imperial College and other institutions also would like to do that. And I think we should certainly look in that direction. You know, when, um, when I, it's interesting to read um, Abdus Salam's Nobel lecture. At the end, he cites um, the Robert Oppenheimer's Reith Lectures, BBC, which is kind of forgotten now, actually, 1953. And almost nobody paid attention, partly because the BBC erased most of them. Can you believe it? So there's only the, the transcripts are there online. And, and I thought it was really interesting that in this context of, um, of looking at things from different perspectives, which is, as you said, what, what diversity really is, is valuable because you get different lights shone on the problem. And, and in Oppenheimer's Reith lectures, actually, which obviously Abdus Salam must have felt were important because that was the last quote in his Nobel lecture. Uh, Oppenheimer said that, so they were called science and the common understanding. And it was, is, what, 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 are there any transferable skills you develop from trying to interrogate nature that you can use in other areas of human endeavor? And this idea, I mentioned with Heisenberg's idea that you can, the proton and neutron are kind of two, two sides of the same coin which goes down to the quarks. And the, so the, he said that, he said, if you think about an electron, then you can think of it as a, a point light particle. Sometimes it's right to do that. It bounces off things and that's, you can think of it like that. But some other times you have to think of it as a more extended wavy thing that fills the space that it's in for interference and so on, as I said. So there are, there are at least two ways of looking at that thing. Um, both are necessary, but neither are correct. In order to get a complete picture of an electron, you have to hold both ideas in your head that appear contradictory and actually be able to mix them and that they're both different views of the same thing. And then he, Oppenheimer said, so it is with politics and human societies. So you might say, for example, that you are a, he actually used the word, because McCarthy was after him, I think, at the time. He said, you might be a communist, right? That's what he's, his code for on the left, right? So he said, communist or a libertarian or a conservative or whatever it is. So you might say that the most important thing, that it's all about individual liberty. I don't want to pay much tax and I want to do this. Or it might be about the collective and community. But he said, of course, all these things are present in all people. And you, so you have to develop a view of society that has all of these different aspects if you're going to have a peaceful society and a prosperous society. And I thought, it, to me, it was really interesting that it clearly resonated with Abdus Salam. And, and, and from what I know of, of him, this is the kind of idea that he had in his mind. All people 
uh, have contributions to make, and the ways they look at the world are all valid and useful, and you need them all. And I, I think it was in the air at the time, I guess probably because Oppenheimer thought he was going to be responsible for destroying the world. If we <laughs> so. Yeah. In fact, I would like to add something to this, that uh, if you look at it, the relevance of this idea is even more today than perhaps at the time of Salam, because some of the global challenges that we face, like climate, you know, it, it really absolutely essential that we have everybody, it is a global problem, you cannot solve it in CERN, you cannot solve it in CERN, it has to be really a global response, and therefore having global science and it can only be solved through science. Uh, so having a global community of scientists is really fundamentally important for human civilization, even more today than it was in the 60s. It's good to know there's a positive aspect to all the global challenges we have today. <laughs> Uh, maybe let me follow on, on that from the more the science perspective. We've seen a, a list of open questions um, from the standard model that we still need to answer. Do you think that we, we, we love the symmetry and there's some, some sort of aesthetic that, that we like to have things in a symmetric way? Do you think, and that was very, very implicit in your, in your talk, um, is it that we need to think of it in a different way? Is it the way we are thinking about the standard model now uh, is too rigid and we need to think of it as, with a slightly different view to address some of those problems? Oh, um, I, well, one, the thing I didn't talk about, maybe, I, maybe I'll answer it like this. The, the, thing, the, the, the only bit of research I do now is the thing I didn't talk about, which, is, um, which is concerns black holes. And um, so maybe you'll comment, because you're an expert as well on this, but the, the, this idea, it comes from, well, many ideas, but one of them is a so-called ADS-CFT correspondence, and Maldacena's great discovery. The, there are it's a bit different ways of looking at the world again. It, it, it looks like you, you can characterize this room, and this is a bit of a leap, but you can characterize everything in this room somehow in an entangled quantum theory that lives on a boundary surrounding it. I always say to, when I give public talks, actually, if, if a physicist says in some sense, it means that they're waving their hands around quite a lot. There's a lot of hand waving in that statement, right? But it comes from the study of black holes and event horizons and, and back to Bekenstein and Hawking, actually, and the entropy of a black hole, the hidden information. So this idea of holography, as it's become known, seems to me to be potentially, what, what it seems to be saying is there is some potentially some kind of quantum theory with degrees of freedom that are presumably string-like, but we're not sure, that, that, that is underpinning not only the standard model, but space and time. So out of that theory emerges the concept of distance and presumably somehow time, but that's further off. And so I... I yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, string theory is an attempt uh, to go beyond this picture of particles that we discussed. And somehow you imagine that the fundamental constituents of matter are not point-like, but they're like little strings of energy. And it's almost childish looking idea, you know, okay, what's the big deal? But that turns out to be really a profound idea uh, for some reason. And many of these very non-trivial consequences follow from that idea, including this idea of holography that somehow in a theory of quantum gravity, the information is stored on the surface of the black hole, not inside the black hole. Or the, there are other symmetries called duality symmetries, new kinds of symmetries have been discovered. So I think there are, uh, or the understanding of the uh, temperature, the Hawking temperature of black hole, uh, the entropy of the black hole, uh, has become possible, which was not po possible uh, when Hawking discovered it. So I think there has been steady progress on certain very difficult problems, but I think we are very far, I would say, from really making contact with uh, experiments where we can say for sure that this is the theory that we understand. So it's a little bit like how we were. In some ways, the physicists of that era were lucky that there was an abundance of experimental uh, 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 you know, impetus Whereas here, in a way, theorists are ahead of the experimentalist in some ways. Uh, but that, so it's a little bit more treacherous exercise because you, you sometimes you can be making a big mistake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, related to that, I think we can share the story that uh, Salam was one of the proponent of uh, Lisa, 
some 30 years ago, so 40 years ago, um, really pushing for it. And it's just been accepted last week. Uh, and that's really going to be one of the great missions that may push our understanding and push the um, fundamental physics. So I think it's a good uh, ending to, to this story. Yeah. Um, but related to black hole, because I think <laughs> the audience was expecting to hear black hole, so I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned it. There was a question of someone asking, uh, how do we know black hole really exist? And, and how massive are they? Are they all supermassive objects, or, or what are they? I mean, we've got a photo, we've got a photo of one, <laughs> of two, <laughs> actually, for example. Some of the, the most, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence going back, but the most direct evidence, I think, is the, the event horizon. Um, image, radio telescope image of the black hole in M87 and subsequently the one in the Milky Way. And that one is, what's the number? It's over six billion times the mass of our sun, um, which is big, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it means the Schwarzschild radius is, what, 18 billion kilometers? Um, so it's, it's a big thing. You could fit our solar system across that a few times. Yes. Uh, so, so, yeah, so the answer is... But I mean, also, we, the, you mentioned gravitational wave detectors, LISA, so some of the key evidence now, we, we see them colliding pretty much all the time, which I think was a shock to everybody. <laughs> There's a lot of collisions, and we see the ripples in, in space-time, the gravitational waves from them. But I, for me, the, if anyone is even remotely skeptical, you, I, I could probably find it on my laptop, actually. If I can wander over there. You, you answer, I'll go find the picture. I'll put it up, because I've got it. Right, so. so I think also uh, the event horizon is one uh, direct uh, observation experiment, you would say. But this uh, LIGO experiment was also quite spectacular because it really confirms Einstein's uh, equations. And uh, it essentially, the what you observe, I mean, it's rather remarkable that this was, uh, and these black holes are not very big. Their masses are of the order of tens of uh, solar masses, not billions of solar masses. So this is something that happened 1.2 billion years ago two black holes uh, of masses, 10 solar masses, spiraled around and combined into one big black hole and exploded and emitted this enormous energy. And those waves were traveling for 1.2 billion years. And it just so happens that, you know, we, the descendants of monkeys, by that time had figured out how to figure, make a laser uh, interferometer. And just then they passed this and we say, wow, you know, we discovered these black holes. But what is even more remarkable is that what is observed really beautifully fits numerical simulations of Einstein's gravity, uh, assuming that these two black holes are merging into one. So I think now the evidence for black holes is really incontrovertible, is what I would say. I think, I think what's remarkable, so I'll, I'll go through it, uh, sorry. What's remarkable with these gravitational waves is that we really see in some ways they behave very much like light, they behave very much like the other forces of nature that that we know exists. So again, we're going back to the same thing. You want to show? I was going to say, do you want to show the picture? If you just <laughs> there is, there that is. is. So that that is a the M87 black hole, six billion solar masses. So it's there. And the, the wonderful thing is, it's the if if you do, you know, the, the simulation like the film Interstellar, for example. That that's that's a simulation of a black hole. It's iconic that weird donut kind of shape. And that that. That computer code was written, developed by Kip Thorne. And so the, the, the black hole in Stella is a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And that's it, if you accept there's a disk of material around it. And it does look like that. So, and that was discovered afterwards. That was, when was that? Two years ago? Was that three years ago, I think? It was flies. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. They exist. <laughs> Okay, I, I got a sign that we have one more question. So um, for the last question, I'm going to adapt one from um, Adil. Thank you for, for the question. Uh, and the question is based on the fact that we, we see different layers of unification. Actually, I wanted to show you uh, all the layers of unification we have. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if I could bring a slide, so, so I brought a T-shirt where you can see all the... <laughs> 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 So, so Atish, you mentioned how we are uh, unifying electricity and magnetism. We have, through uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, unified uh, space and, well, through special relativity, we unified uh, space and time. And you see, we've been through so many layers of them. Um, is there ever going to be an end to it? Where, where are we headed? Where, where would you like to be headed? And is this ever going to end? 
<laughs> and we're expecting an answer. <laughs> I would be happy if uh, we succeed in unifying what we know already, which is gravity. With, and I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's uh, hard. I think it's also pointless to speculate, I mean, because I think life is full of surprises, so you don't know what will happen 50 years from now. There's been tremendous progress, hasn't there, in this field of emergent space-time, or whatever you want to call that field. You know, this idea that you can, um, essentially from quantum entanglement, you can begin to see a hint of a geometry, particularly. This is why I think quantum computing is interesting, because particularly that when, when you impose things like an, an error correction demand on qubits, on, on bits of quantum information, you, you end up with networks of them. You're building them in order to protect one of them from errors, which you want to do in a quantum computer memory. But you end up with a geometry which looks like ADS, actually, <laughs> doesn't it? So at some level, it's called a happy code, isn't that, it? That does one? everybody know and what so, ADS is? Anti so, so, so basically, this idea that we're beginning to see a glimpse of something that looks like distance from a demand, an information theoretic demand on something, yes. so is, is interesting, I think. Yeah, I think there is, I, I, clearly there is some new deep connection that has becoming, we have very few glimpses of it, is that uh, when there is very, so quantum entanglement is what is responsible for our ability to be able to do quantum computations. And the idea that an electron here is entangled with something in Andromeda galaxy uh, because of what Einstein called the spooky action at distance, uh, that somehow is linked to the fact that there is a smooth geometry connecting these two I, two uh, two pieces of com uh, conformal field here. So I mean, so there is some deep connection between the fact that of uh, exact quantum entanglement and smooth space time of the kind that we see around us, and. Uh, what that connection is, I think it's a very fascinating question, and it's one of the, I think, important areas of research currently. Okay, I think this is uh, your homework for, for tonight. <laughs> thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Atish, and thanks you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So uh, I really wanted to thank all of Imperial College, the physics department, and particularly the institutional event for making this possible. Rene York, you've been amazing throughout the process. It's been 10 months since uh, in the making. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rene.